Good. So um, the, our opening panel today um, is on AI and climate change. Um, I'm David Goldston. I'm the director of the MIT Washington office. Uh, and you can find uh, my biography and those of the other uh, speakers um, in your program. We also have uh, with me Uwe Stewart from data.org, Topaz Mukulu from uh, the McGovern Foundation, and Priya Dante, uh, also from MIT, which was just coincidence. We didn't set up the panel. So um, um, you just can't get away from us. So um, uh, throughout this, we'll, be, uh, we'll have a discussion up here, and then we'll open it up to questions. We'll try to leave at least half the time for Q&A. For those um, watching online, you can get questions to us through Slido, and when we go to that, we'll alternate um, questions from the audience here and questions that have been set, uh, sent in. So uh, I wanted to start with a, um, a broad question. I was noticing this morning that actually if you don't do this in the audience. If you Google AI and climate change, you get a lot of positive stories about how AI will solve climate change. And if you Google AI and energy use, you get a lot of stories about how the apocalypse is here. So um, we have this kind of Janus-faced situation. Um, both of those obviously are somewhat true and not entirely true. So I want to ask each of our panelists, um, what makes you most hopeful about AI and climate, and what are you most worried about? And then we'll move from that into sort of what to do about it. So, um, Uwe, do you want to start? Thank you, David. Um, I would love to start. Um, what makes me hopeful? As a practitioner in artificial intelligence for the last two decades, is that I've seen tremendous progress in the ability for this technology to help to generate great insights from data whether it's in diagnostics, whether it's in optimization, or even prediction. I'll tell you a quick story. I live in Quantico, just 30 miles from here, and yesterday I was driving up to DC. And what I had to do was to check the news at five o'clock. And they told me there was a thunderstorm that was coming through Quantico, and that it's gonna go through DC. But I looked at the accuracy of the prediction in terms of the time range. And I knew that I had 40 minutes to get out of my house and get, <laughs> and get to the hotel. And I did. There's a point there. It's about this technology and the online data is becoming more accurate. That's what makes me hopeful. But that itself also is like an oxymoron, is what makes me worried. I need to acknowledge the elephant in the room, that there is a digital divide between the so-called global north and the global south. And that we need to start to pay attention to those who are marginalized and vulnerable. That this technology, AI itself, is data hungry and is exacerbating this digital divide. And we have to do something about it. I'll tell you another quick story. And then I'll make three big points. And I'll come back to you, David. Um, in my organization, I travel around the world a lot, and we are very focused on uh, using data and AI uh, to help uh, social impact organizations to address pressing challenges, including climate change. And so in this responsibility, I was in a part in Africa, and there was no prediction that it was going to rain. It was torrential rain, and the rain caused flooding, and I was stuck. I couldn't travel out. But forget me, it's what happened within the community. From one flooding incident, half a million people were displaced from their homes. But it gets worse. They were moved into a camp, and in the camp, the kids could no longer go to school. In the camp, the parents lost their source of income. In the camp, young girls were molested. Here is the point, that climate change is having very negative impact across all sectors of society from this example. And so my three call to action is this. Number one, that artificial intelligence 
is more than data. It is socio-technical. When we focus on the data, we are neglecting all of the culture, the beliefs, and aspirations of the people that are extracted away and, and removed in this transformation that we are having, especially with the focus on in the global north. That's number one. The second big thing that I like to say, based on this example that I just gave, is that we need to approach this commingling of AI and climate change from an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary perspective. As I just said, when it rains and there is flooding, the impact is not just that there is rain, but people are displaced, there's financial inclusion, there's education, there's public health, so on and so forth. I leave those two points right now, and I'll come back and make one more later, David. Okay, we will get back to you because we'll be talking more about solutions as we go. Priya. Yeah, thank you. And I want to plus one everything you just said. Um, but so I'll give sort of a different set of, of, of kind of hope here. So I would say that um, echoing Uli, I think there are lots of ways that, that AI is, is in its, you know, starting to mature in order to, to enable climate change related work from, you know, um, helping us better, you know, predict the weather, be better optimize power grids and heating and cooling systems, and, and also do things like accelerate scientific discovery. And I think along with those applications, what heartens me is seeing a community of people, not just from computer science and AI backgrounds, but from a wide variety of backgrounds who are basically asking this question of, we need to move quickly on climate, and how do we appropriately leverage all of the tools at our disposal, AI is one of them, in order to move as fast as we can. So that gives me hope that we're basically trying to really assess what we can do and, and really use everything at our disposal. Um, there are a couple of kind of counterparts to that, though, in terms of the fear. So one, the community that is often kind of bringing forth AI tools is often a very privileged community, often centered in the global north. And if we truly want AI to enable kind of global and equitable climate action, that means we really have to focus on ground up education and capacity building across many different contexts and across the world in order to ensure that the way we develop AI for climate is really is coming from those places of experience, those contexts, those communities, rather than being hoisted top down from a small set of people onto the rest of the world. Um, I also worry about honestly, like the, the current narrative around this Janus space, AI, um, AI being good for, for climate because of its applications and AI being bad for climate because of its energy usage, because I actually think it leaves out what should be a very big elephant in the room, which is the applications of AI that are uh, counteracting climate action. So AI is being used to accelerate oil and gas exploration and extraction. It's also a big driver of Things like targeted advertising that change how we consume or of how we consume information about climate online. And it's also a driver of technologies like autonomous vehicles where we have choices about how those are developed, but they can be developed in a way that entrenches private energy intensive transportation or they can be enabler towards public transportation. So when we talk about AI has good climate applications, but the bad part is its energy usage, we're actually leaving out this big piece about the fact that AI is an accelerator of many of our systems across society. And if we don't align that aspect of it as well, if we don't align business as usual AI with climate as well, then we're actually um, going to exacerbate the problem. So I think we really need to make sure we're, we're taking all of these pieces of the puzzle into account. clearly is an important point, um, I guess, in Google AI and other problems. Um, the um, Topaz. Yeah, uh, my co-panelists have done a great job of just setting the scene. Um, and I'll just put stamp on a lot of what has been said. I think there are two challenges when we think about AI and climate change. There's the data challenge, and there's also the usability of that data challenge. And what I mean by that is, you know, like a lot of the data that exists um, in different forms can be useful if, of course, it is, is uh, context specific. But then there's also the challenge of, is it ex are these models that are being built explainable? Are they being built in an explainable way? You know, we talk about black boxes um, and we also talk about who this data is for. And so when we think about the use of data for decision making, 
um, there's this critical element um, that we need to remember is it's important for data to also be leveraged for tools um, that can enable a lot of this action to happen. Um, and also to ensure that decision makers are equipped with the tools that they need to understand that data and to actually make clever and smart decisions when it comes to climate change. And so I think those are two, two areas that I just wanted to highlight. Um, at the McGovern Foundation, we support a lot of innovative solutions that um, are you know, focusing on this explainability component. Um, one of our partners that I'll just highlight is Open Earth Foundation. Um, they have looked at, you know, um, a lot of the cities that exist in this world, there's only 5% of cities actually have the tools that they need to understand the, the data coming in on um, greenhouse gas inventories. And so their work is to build these inventories for cities. So taking data from satellites, taking data from uh, local communities and um, creating a streamlining of this data so that it, it can exist in one place and equip city officials who are very busy, very uh, resource constrained with the tools that they need to make quick decisions um, that are well informed. Um, and so I think that's just one example of some of the ways that we can think about this. Um, in terms of just uh, concerns, I will say uh, to Priya's point, um, there's a huge issue when we think about bias and equity um, and you know the whole notion of garbage in, garbage out. Uh, I think also if you have quote unquote good data, so data that's complete, data that um, you might consider um, comprehensive, if it's coming from one specific region, um, we're thinking about the global north and it's being used in a different context that is unrepresentative of, of the data, then that's also garbage, you know? So it's, it's good data in and it's garbage out. And so I think one of the things that we really need to think about is um, data um, equity. And that really is about ensuring that we're incorporating community, the communities in the data collect, collection efforts. Um, there are of course challenges related to that uh, when we think about the need for digitization um, and moving a lot of the um, physical data into digitized formats, that's another consideration. But really, at the end of the day, the impact is felt when data is context specific, when it's relevant. Um, and yeah, I'll just stop there. Great, thanks. That covered uh, all of the whole panel, wide range of things. So um, one thing that strikes me about um, all your responses is that they're all kind of about climate in general and AI in general. That's not a criticism. I mean, that's a, the nature of the, the issue, right? They're really about this whole thing. So the, the next question is about what you, and Tope has started answering this with her discussion about what McGovern is funding, but what projects, activities do you see that are moving things in the right direction on AI and climate? And maybe as part of that, also think out loud a little bit about to what extent they're like specific AI and climate things, or is it just dealing with what we have to deal with in AI and deal with what we have to deal with in climate and that'll end up addressing AI and climate also. How specifically should we, we be looking at AI and climate as a separate thing? Um, uh, Topaz. Um, That's a great question. I think, I think you can look at it separately, but you can also look at it in more specifically. I'll give a few more examples just to illustrate this point. Um, when we think about satellite data, and um, Earth observation data, and we think about the ways that maps are created. Um, a lot of that, a lot of the way that maps exist are sort of built for commercial use. They tend to be, they might be outdated, and they cover very comprehensively certain regions of the world, whereas there's not really a commercial incentive to map regions of the world that are more um, prone to crises or more vulnerable. And so, um, efforts that do exist to map those regions tend to be fragmented because you can't as a single individual um, have this comprehensive map. So there's a lot of fragmented efforts. And, and so when we think about the ways in which AI can sort of support those efforts, uh, one of our partners, uh, Humanitarian OpenStreetMap, they're doing a lot of work on what they call missing maps. Um, and so that's really taking the humans and AI's sort of capabilities 
to speed up the process of mapping. And so they have field mappers that are going, you know, door to door. When you're traveling through a street, you see certain um, features and details that uh, satellite imagery might miss. And so they take all of that information um, and they sort of feed it into these uh, community mappers that exist um, looking at open street maps. And they take that data and um, combine it with satellite imagery data. And they're able to process all of that in a at a greater speed and validate that information. You know, a lot of uh, the challenge when you talk about community um, inputs to data is you also have to incorporate validation when you're getting data from different sources. Um, and so I think that's one way that that um, AI and climate can sort of uh, merge. I think more directly, um, there's a group doing a lot of great work in Rajasthan, in India, and um, they're looking at energy and um, the reality that you know, uh, a lot of these grids, when you're trying to incorporate solar and renewable energy, it's really hard to, pre to predict and to um, measure how much solar energy is available. And so they've figured out ways to um, sort of test and see, um, use algorithms and models to test and see, predict when there's going to be um, more solar energy. And so there are obviously complexities related to that. There's cloud cover, there's rain. And so they're able to have a higher greater, higher percentage of accuracy and get those details down and support grid operators in India in um, incorporating some of the solar energy into, you know, whether it's um, coal and wind. And so you have a more, um, you're painting a bigger picture where there's some renewable energy incorporated and that helps with the transition to more renewables. And so those are just some of the examples that I think I've seen where um, there's a lot of work that are bridging both spaces. Great, Priya, and maybe also, although this is more in the broad sense, some of the, if you have thoughts on positive things going on on that problem you spoke about, about the ways in which AI is changing societies in ways, society in ways that may exacerbate climate. Sure. So first, let me start with the yeah the positive. So I, I to to get to your base question of you know are AI and climate things that can be done separately or do they need to be done together? So I think that the kind of area of AI applied to climate has benefited a lot so far from general advancements in AI, but that increasingly the way we need to develop AI for climate related problems needs to contend with the specific characteristics of climate problems. So to make that more concrete. Some of the kind of earlier breakthroughs in, in the use of deep learning for image recognition came from the development of convolutional neural networks. And convolutions are components of a neural network that actually encode structure that is specific to how images look. The fact that kind of pixels near each other will look similar, that there's some repeated structure across the image, that is actually encoded into the way that the neural network is architected. And so what that means is that even though we often think about deep learning for image recognition as a general advancement, it was actually an application specific advancement looking specifically at the application of image recognition and the specific structure associated with that application. So then when we think about AI applied across society, then it's worth thinking about, okay, what assumptions are we making when actually developing these methods? And are those assumptions actually well matched to the requirements of the applications we have on the ground? So for example, if we think about AI in the context of power grids, on power grids, you're dealing with physical signals. You're dealing with an engineering system that has robustness constraints. You have to make sure that your methods satisfy various notions of safety. And that actually has to be baked into the way you design those methods in the first place. And that's a very different assumption if you're somebody designing a chatbot like GPT. And so you have to basically really think about the fact that all of these general advancements in AI are developed with certain assumptions in place. And in the case of, for example, um, many applications in Silicon Valley, that's assumptions of large amounts of clean internet data often, or clean, but large amounts of internet data, um, large amounts of compute that allow you to develop very large models, and often not these same notions of safety or interpretability that are often relevant across different contexts. And so I think there's really a lot of room for for, for kind of application-driven innovation in AI that really contends on the, with the on-the-ground needs of climate applications. So I'll give uh, two examples of this. 
Um, one of them is a um, company called AIonix that uses AI to accelerate the discovery of batteries. They basically kind of work with different battery manufacturers to figure out how to create a better battery for different applications like you know, electric vehicles or for, for grid um, frequency uh, control on, on grids and so forth. And what they do is they learn from the outcomes of past experiments to synthesize a battery in order to suggest what to do next. But this is a setting where you actually don't have a ton of data because you haven't, when, when you actually synthesize and test a battery, there's only so much data you can get and there are only so many batteries you can test. And different battery manufacturers often don't want to share data between each other. So this, there, this is a sparse data problem. But it's also a physics problem. So what do you do? You actually make physics-informed machine learning methods that actually combine physical knowledge with the data you have, and doing that, you're able to come up with a, a way to kind of accelerate battery discovery. Another example I'll give is um, Climate Trace, which is an um, international coalition of organizations that's trying to leverage their satellite imagery and on-the-ground data to come up with independent greenhouse gas emissions inventories as a, a kind of input to the um, UN climate negotiations. And what they do, if, if someone says, oh, satellite imagery for greenhouse gas emissions tracking, you might just think, oh, we have satellite images. Can you like see the plumes in there? And, and no, you, you can't. You have to really understand, okay, if I'm looking at greenhouse gas emissions in energy, well, I have some maybe off the ground data about correlations between the kind of heat output I see in a particular facility and what that usually means in terms of the, the um, amount of emissions with it. So you use that kind of on the ground domain specific knowledge about how different quantities connect. And then you use your knowledge about what you can, what data streams you have and what you can actually get from AI. And you put those together and come up with a very specific way where AI is one part of the, the, the broader workflow in order to figure out what to do. So really a lot of these places kind of AI and kind of knowledge of the on, on the ground requirements are coming together in nuanced ways that really change how you actually approach the AI pipeline and so I think it's really important to, to do these things together and so um, this is why I think kind of large-scale education and capacity building as well as targeted initiatives to actually enable AI climate innovation to come together are, are really important and so um, some of the stuff we're doing at Climate Change AI, for example, we run a, a large-scale summer school on the education front and a, um, a grants program uh, to actually fund work, uh, research at the intersection of AI and climate. Like the grants uh, call launched today, so if you want to apply, you should feel free. Um, and yeah, so I would say the, the, yeah, these kinds of initiatives bringing these together are really important. Um, I have gone on for a while. Do you still want me to go into the negative? Well, let's go to Uli and then yeah, we'll um, probably catch some of the rest of that in the next question. That's Thanks. Good. That was all very relevant though. Uli. Yeah, I try not to be negative, which is hard to be. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, again, I'm so focused on just the marginalized and vulnerable. And, and it's hard not to be negative, but I try not to be. Um, accuracy matters, especially when it comes to climate risk management. Um, but to be accurate, you need, as my panelists, co-panelists have said, representative data. Um, and that does not exist right now for you know, a large proportion of communities around the world. And so I'd like to talk about two projects where the application of AI is moving the needle a little bit. So I started out broadly negative, but I'm gonna be a little positive now. Um, one is that around Right now, what is happening in the global south is that uh, uh, communities and climate scientists uh, inherit uh, climate models that are created in the global north, in the universities, and therefore they are asked to sort of use those for prediction and modeling. Um, and, and as I already said, accuracy matters. But there's a big problem in, in the fact that those models themselves are not at a special scale to inform the right decisions across these communities. And so the technical term is around downscaling, uh, which is basically going from this you know, super archy model to uh, a level that is at a granularity in kilometers that is really usable and understandable across the communities. AI is doing wonders there. The problem is that it is not at scale right now. So that's one positive. And so there are funders in the room. There is that application of AI in downscaling these uh, hybrid models to become 
hyper-local in terms of the right parameters to inform decisions at the local level. But it exists, it's not a skill. Here is a second good project, and then I'll turn it back to you. Um, as my co-panelists have hinted at, uh, current advances in AI right now are driven mainly by two languages, English and Mandarin. But there are roughly 7,000 languages in the world. So when you talk about equity and inclusion, go figure, right? However, however, there is a great project that maybe I can mention, it's Google, right? It's uh, sponsoring in India. It's called Project Vani. Uh, what it's doing is basically uh, creating an open source repository of speech data to enable startups and communities to begin to build AI models, acoustic models, and translation models to allow for the digitization of these languages so that they are online and therefore stop this problem of the digital divide. I think that's a plus. The problem, again, is that it's a one-off and there's not enough of that. So I've mentioned great projects, but then we need to take them to scale. So um, we're going to talk about private sector also, but we're in DC. <laughs> So where does government policy fit in? I mean, we've been talking about both national and international policy. There's lots of different places where government policy could be helpful, harmful. Um, what are some things that you see happening that are good or bad now, and what ought to be happening? Priya, why don't we start with you on this one? So um, I think that um, governments can play a, a very big role right, in kind of um, uh, funding some of the enabling infrastructure like data, computational access, and also um, through kind of research funding streams and implementation funding streams. Now, I will say, I think it is the wrong move to take climate funding streams that are method agnostic and turn them into climate for a funding streams. Let's keep climate funding streams focused on the goal and sort of ensure that there are experts in the room who can evaluate, again, a broad set of techniques, including AI. But I think there is a really large case for taking AI innovation funding streams and ensuring that portions of those are focused on climate because first, we should all be focused on climate, but also, I mean, again, there I think the directions of AI innovation look different when you look at different sets of applications. And so from an AI innovation perspective as well, you wanna enrich the directions of AI innovation. Um, I think in terms of the broader kind of impacts of AI um, that are negative for climate in terms of things like energy usage and its, its uh, negative applications. Um, I think there have been some, some great initial moves. So for example, um, the, oh gosh, I'm gonna butcher the name of the act, but the AI Environmental Impact Act that was introduced um, in uh, you know, several months ago in the US that really tried to say, you know, can we get the EPA and NIST the ability to to develop a framework to actually assess um, how, what AI's impacts on climate are, both good and bad, and kind of uh, create you know, voluntary reporting standards um, in order to, to actually surface that information, make it more transparent, and enable us to, to come up in a more targeted way with how to act. Um, and the EU AI, AI Act, for example, also has some provisions on uh, kind of uh, uh, labeling high-risk AI systems as one that ones that may have um, bad implications for the environment, as well as in certain cases collecting information about things like energy usage. And so, I think some of these efforts towards increased transparency, increased um, regulation and reporting are are really important. That said, a lot of stuff remains voluntary, and I think we we have to get serious about understanding where kind of mandates um, and and required reporting requirements are are going to play a role. Um, I was going to ask you if you're going to get to to regulation, but maybe we'll come back to that more fully. Uh, Uwe. Yes. Um, artificial intelligence is not a magic bullet. It's not a silver bullet, right? So uh, policy plays a role, uh, a big role. Um, and I, I, my analogy, I was talking to my daughter yesterday. I was prepping for this panel. And she asked me a great question. And I said, you know, when we are driving, uh, we see the speed sign that says 65 or 70. And that's a policy. It's actually a public health policy. And what it has done is that it has informed behavior change. Right? And now when I'm driving, I'm checking, am I exceeding the speed limit? What we need when it comes to climate change as well, from a policy perspective, is governments to get serious about 
the quadrant in how we manage climate change. Right now, there is a fixation, and, and it's right, on mitigation. And there is some attention on adaptation. But if you look at Houston right now, or if you go to Boston, or even in this area when you look at heat resilience, we are already suffering from the impact of climate change. So no one is really looking at policy around adaptation, transition, and resilience. And so I think policy needs to be overarching, not just a focus on mitigation, which is great, or adaptation, which we need, but people are being affected today. And so we need policy around transition and res resilience to allow societies and those who are being affected to actually live for tomorrow. Thanks. I have to say the speed limits are higher around Quantico. But the, um, <laughs> Where I live. <laughs> um, so pass. Um, yeah, just to, I mean, I think my co-panelists have covered a lot of it. Um, I do think that creating this enabling environment and ecosystem that encourages um, organizations and nonprofits and civil society actors to actually innovate on their ideas is important. Um, and that I think w w what Priya said, it's, it's really critical to be able to um, have the funding needed to do that. And um, governments do have a role to play there, um, as well as philanthropy, which I think we can talk about a little later. Uh, but governments do have a role to play in that and in, in research. I think research funding is really, really important. And um, being able to support that research in a sustainable way um, can help not just nonprofits and uh, civil society actors, but also academia. I think um, MIT has done a, a great job um, at publishing a lot of a lot of the information that they've been able to to get. Um, one of the things that I think is lacking um, in the climate space is open data. And so government policies that sort of push for more open data, um, not just uh, for nonprofits, but also with private sector actors, that's really critical um, so that folks that aren't able to you know, afford uh, some of the initiatives that are needed to implement some of the ideas can pull from an ecosystem and a wealth of knowledge. Um, so yeah, I think those are some important things. Thanks. And Can we, oh yeah, please, there? sure. Um, yeah, and I think this, um, yeah, I think the, the push for open data is really critical and together with that, um, the kind of ensuring that the communities whose data is being collected have, you know, appropriate sovereignty and are, are compensated for that and kind of explicitly enabling that within um, within the funding mechanism. So for instance, there are, you know, depending on the governmental funding mechanism, when I apply in an academic role, right, I may or may not actually be able to, um, you know, use some of that grant money outside of the context of my academic institution. But if I'm working with a particular community to do data collection, I should be able to compensate them. So kind of ensuring that um, some of these things are, are, are enabled and, and allowed within the fun funding mechanisms, I think is really important. Great, so um, let's look at the private sector. So what you see them doing and not doing, and then maybe to connect the questions, are there things you think that the private sector has to do that will only happen if there's some kind of policy mandate? Um, who should we start with this time? You, Uwe, why do we start with you? Yes, um, I talked about the private sector already. If, if it's okay, David, can I add philanthropy? Absolutely. Is that all right? Yes. Because uh, I, I used to work in, in philanthropy. Uh, I, I think and actually, we're trying, we want to include philanthropy in private sector, especially since we have both Excellent. the current and former philanthropists. Here. Excellent. So I'll do philanthropy, and then my colleagues can do private sector. Um, so if you recall the uh, story I told about my uh, experience uh, on a recent trip to Africa, uh, sort of uh, externalizes uh, the need for us when we apply AI to climate change to think transdisciplinary, uh, to think multi-sectorially. Philanthropists don't think that way. They're very siloed and fragmented and they focus on the core initiatives that they fund. And that's the problem. So if I go back to the story I told, one flooding incident creates a problem that is not just about education, but is also financial inclusion, is not also just about public health. So if a philanthropic organization is only focused on public health, guess what? You are not going to achieve the impact that you are looking for. 
And so what we need is this coordination across philanthropic organizations and in how they fund so that we can actually collectively achieve the impact that we're looking for. Because climate impact on society is cross-sectoral. That's a good point. Obviously, there's that kind of stovepiping sometimes in government as well. Um, Topaz, you're the, yeah. the working philanthropist. I'll throw it to you from that. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just draw on that thread. Um, I think collaboration is really important, and you do need to know what's happening in different sectors. Um, at the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation, we focus a lot on tech and AI in service of a certain social outcome. And so we have different streams uh, that we, of bu buckets that we focus on. We have a uh, focus on public health, on climate, on education, and that AI literacy component and how important it is for folks to have that fundamental AI literacy and understand um, how to engage with these technologies. And we also have a focus on, you know, the humanitarian side of things. And even from my conversations with different, with different partners, I see some of the ways that different industries can learn from each other. And so I think that's a big role that philanthropy can and should play and that we try to play is acting as a sort of ecosystem convener. You know, you have a bird's eye view in many ways um, of the different efforts that are taking hold. And so one of the things that we try to do is connecting folks that are working in different areas, but in issues that might be complementary to each other. So for example, uh, last year during climate week, we held a workshop on um, unstructured data and pulled you know, partners working in that same challenge area. So you know, it's really hard to deal with unstructured data. How are you navigating it from the health perspective? How are you navigating it from um, the climate perspective? And I think the insight there can be so, so, so um, impactful. I do think too um, that in addition to you know, being a space where folks can learn, there's also something to be said about uh, joint funding initiatives. And so looking at uh, folks working you know, further up, upstream on projects um, and others working further downstream and looking at ways to connect projects together and so that one initiative is feeding into the, the other. I think you had mentioned Climate Trace. Climate Trace is one of our partners and they do a really good job of acting as um, you know, an, an overarching partner and supporting a lot of the work that's being done downstream. And so that's one area. Um, I did want to mention private sector and, and uh, the role there. Private sector has, the private sector has a lot of good data. Um, they, have, they have a lot of good data because if you think of the financial sector, if you think of um, the investment sector, a lot of their decisions are underwritten. And so they, they think through um, how can they sort of if you were to ask someone that's working in private sector, oh, like what's happening in this region? They have a lot of information and data on, oh, what's going to happen in, let's say Kenya, that's where I'm from. So what's going to happen in Kenya for in the next five, 10, 15, 20 years? And that information sort of sits within, you know, their clients, their clients and um, doesn't really stream onto the communities. And so I think we need to start to push private sectors to sort of open up that data in a way that's, um, that also accounts for, you know, you can anonymize that data. How can we sort of strip it of um, the information that might be sensitive, um, but really making sure that it's in the hands of the community as well. And so that's, that's one of the areas that I think private sector has a significant role to play. And then just really quickly, we had mentioned um, just the importance of accuracy with models and how much can be done with smaller models. I think um, the private sector can do a lot in terms of looking at, you know, how can we focus on um, not just large language models, but smaller models that are very specific to the issue um, and are less of a concern in terms of energy efficiency and some of the other concerns that we sort of brought up. Um, yeah. Great, and we'll start moving to uh, questions from the audience shortly. So if people wanna start lining up at the mics, um, folks can do that. Um, Priya, um, your thoughts on private sector, including philanthropy, but not exclusive to that and the intersection between government and private sector. Sure, so I think that the private sector writ large, right, can bring a lot of muscle to actually kind of moving forward specific, for example, uses of AI for climate action. Um, 
but uh, but I also think that in order to ensure that this ecosystem is equitable, that again, you don't have you know a few uh, technology providers who are monopolizing the ecosystem, I think actually governments can do a lot to um, encourage and enable kind of a distributed and a diverse um, ecosystem of, of AI solutions providers that are actually tuned into the needs of different geographies, sectors. So for example, again, the way you do AI for energy sector applications looks very different than if you're doing AI for disaster response, which looks very different than if you're doing AI for, for, for uh, you know, generic image recognition. And so I think really enabling that, that, that more distributed and diverse expertise, as well as um, uh, kind of requiring some level of um, interoperability between solutions providers so that, for example, if you're a city that's procuring services from a particular solutions provider, you're not necessarily locked in forever to that one solutions provider where they now have the ability to drive your city's agenda forever. Um, I think the kind of creating that enabling ecosystem is, is um, really uh, important. Great. Thanks. Um, we'll start taking audience questions. Uh, people can identify themselves and Obviously, keep your question as concise as possible and make sure it actually is a question. Um, and as I said, we'll go back and forth uh, with the uh, uh, questions that are being sent in online, where I know somewhere someone will be, there we go, at that table, people will be um, letting us know what those questions are. Sir. I understand the first question is to be a virtual question. Yes, thank ah, you so okay. much. So Better prepared than I am. That's uh, Go ahead, please. Our first question from our online audience is, how can we ensure that we have proper policies in place so that we can direct the power of AI in actually mitigating climate change and not exacerbating it? OK, so sort of chance to talk a little bit more on, on policy and, and maybe even some mandates on uh, necessary for mitigating impacts. Um, anyone want to start? Priya. I'm happy to start and basically I think just like um, re-emphasize a point I made earlier, which is that we really need to make sure that the way we're thinking about climate is not just, okay, great, we create this separate initiative that talks a little bit about AI applications for climate and there's some policy encouraging AI for climate, but instead sort of every time we're talking about AI policy or digitalization policy, that climate is a fundamental consideration within that in the same way that of course, equity should also be a fundamental consideration within that. And so, we saw this a little bit, for example, in the um, AI executive order where they were explicitly earmarked, you know, we, the Department of Energy should think about the role of AI in um, kind of improving um, the operation of our power grids in order to, to, to kind of um, decarbonize them. Um, so that was an example of AI for, um, uh, for a climate change related applications, but I think there could be more, again, thinking about the business as usual impacts of AI, and again, not just its energy usage, but also the ways in which it's being used across society to accelerate kind of, you know, carbon negative or, or anti-climate related applications. So this may be an unfair question, we've already, and which you can say, especially since we've got a line of people, but do you have any thoughts on structurally what to do, um, let's say in the US government on that? Like if you were adding something to the executive order um, that would make sure that climate was part of every discussion, what would you recommend? Yeah, so I mean, I think that um, one thing that structurally could happen is that um, when you're creating kind of reporting standards for AI applications, so you might, for example, flag certain classes of applications that need to be reported on, you might report on various aspects, including you know, what are the equity related implications of them? What are the energy consumption related implications of them? And what are the implications of the applications? And that reporting is not often just climate specific, but basically including within your standardized reporting requirements, climate related considerations is Great. one way to do it. Thanks. Okay, now to the audience. Yeah, hi, I'm Michael Replogel, founder of the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. How do we ensure that uh, with the rise of uh, much larger big data centers and cloud computing rising explosively that we don't see that rise causing the perpetuation of our fossil-based uh, energy system as we're now seeing happen in many parts of America and the world? Great. Anyone want to start with that one? I'm not an energy person, but can I 
I, I'm not punting on that question. I just wanted to add one more. Sure. Since I, because there are policymakers in the room. And then we will get to and that question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm in the business of building capacity around the world um, to enable social impact organizations to use data and AI better. And one of the gaps that we see, and I think, you know, again, from a policy perspective, we need to think about it, is what we call the knowledge translators. And so as we work with governments around the world and to help them to think about their AI policy to manage climate, they, they, they don't get it, if I can put it that way. <laughs> I don't know if that's insulting, but, that, you know, uh, there is something missing. There is, there is a missing middle between the great analysis and how it translates into policy or, or actions or de decisions. And there's a whole lot of implementation science and skills required there. No one's really talking about it. And so when I look at what we're doing in the US, and which is fantastic, we are creating chief AI officers. That's, that's great. But where are the knowledge translators? So I think we need a policy just to be specific to introduce both the discipline and the human resource uh, machinery to create that, that uh, uh, skill and profile of knowledge translators in government so that we can actually go from data to action and insights. Right. It's part of the workforce issue that isn't actually talked about as much. That's Priya, that question is probably more in your wheelhouse, so do you want to? Sure, I'm happy to take a step. So I, I think there are two things. One, I think one of the reasons we're seeing things like deferred retirement or, uh, or non-retirement of coal plants due to AI energy use is because we weren't prepared. I think that our projections didn't necessarily account for, for this rise at this particular time. Um, but there's in some sense nothing inherent about kind of any energy, kind of rise in energy usage and that needing to be fueled by, by fossil fuels. So I think just sort of really getting realistic about what rises we may see and incorporating that into our clean energy planning and ensuring that we are actually serving that, that demand through clean energy, that's something we have to do now. That said, um, I think that the one challenge is that if you, if you look at some of the narratives coming from AI solutions providers who are developing some of these larger models, they'll say, oh yeah, I'm terrified about the energy usage of AI and so I'm investing in you know, nuclear fusion, or I'm investing in, in various things like that. And that I'm terrified seems to imply the this is inevitable, and it's not. <laughs> so we have a lot of choices about how we actually develop and use AI and employ AI across society. And every sector of society, including the IC, in, information and communication technology sector, has to go to net zero. That includes AI. So we both need to take the measures to be realistic about what will happen with respect to energy usage and electrification across society and ensure that we're you know, incorporating clean energy planning, but we should also not take AI energy usage rise as an inevitability and instead push uh, those who can do something about it to, to do AI a bit differently. Thanks, you managed to do that without naming uh, anybody in particular, although some people come to mind. Topaz, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think um, to Priya's point as well, it's, we need to shift a lot of these data centers to a reliance on clean energy. Um, and in addition to that, I think a lot of larger organizations, larger private sector organizations have figured out ways to um, run their data centers on more renewable energy, but also running their models in a more um, efficient way. But that data is still not public. And so I think being able to push for a bit more visibility in that space um, is, is one step. Uh, and then also if you think about the aviation industry, you know, now when you book a, a flight ticket, you sort of see this is your carbon footprint or this is how much you will sort of be um, contributing to um, emissions. And so I think a bit more of that visibility as well in um, the AI space would be useful. So as you're creating models and as you're developing all of these innovations, being able to sort of um, indicate how much of, of of that sort of fed into um, emissions. And so I think that would also help incentivize folks to move in a more sustainable direction. It's interesting how much transparency keeps yeah. coming up, which obviously has been um, a big method in environmental law generally, whether it's uh, emissions lists and so forth. Uh, do we have another um, question from the great 
remote beyond? Or we do of beyond? course we do. So our next online question is, how do you address data scarcity when data is unavailable because of another country's data sharing policies in a way that honors sacred traditions and knowledge for indigenous communities? Interesting, since we've talked about sort of data glut and data scarcity both. Um, who you want to start on that? I would love to start. Uh, <laughs> um, did, did, I think uh, uh, Topaz, you mentioned it earlier. There is data. The problem is our ability to share data. I give another example, uh, and I think you gave it Topaz, right? Um, uh, private sector, especially in the global south, and telephone companies sit on a treasure trove of data. And they're waiting, and I don't know what they are waiting for. Um, and they, they expect that at some point they will do something with it. What they don't understand is that the timely extraction of insights from the data is what makes it valuable. So, so what do we need to do? There is technology around uh, privacy enhancing methods. Because the concern really why people don't share data, organizations don't share data, is the personal identifiable information contained within the data or commercial sensitive information contained within the data. And so the fear is if I give my data to David, well, I'm exposing all my business secrets to you, or I run the risk of you know, negative consequences. Well, there is technology right now. There is encryption technology right, that will mask uh, personal identifiable information within the data sets and leaves enough signal for AI to do its work. But the problem is that it's not been adapted. Maybe we should come back to policy, right? <laughs> Maybe we need to promote more, right? We're looking more about data scarcity, but there is technology around privacy enhancing technologies that can allow us to mask all of the sensitive information and expose the data and therefore encourage data sharing across governments, across organizations around the world. So pass. To, to add to that point, um, I think it's also important to look at ways where we can transfer the power of who owns that data. And so, especially when you're working with indigenous communities, you know, there's a lot of work that's being done in forest restoration, land protection, biodiversity. It's really important that communities not only feel like they're a part of the efforts um, to protect their lands, but they also have a level of ownership of that data. And so thinking of ways as you're also like anonymizing that data, but you're also transferring a lot of the tools that are being built back into the community. Um, and I think that also speaks to the level of, you know, you need to build trust. Trust takes time. Who are you working with? Um, and how are you sort of approaching um, these different efforts? Um, I guess just to um, build on something you said much earlier in the panel, one kind of challenge is that when you look at data, it's only one type of sort of knowledge. And so like there are other things that are not captured in there. So I think leveraging um, things, you know, structures like data sheets, for example, and, and kind of documenting some of the other types of context and knowledge that come alongside the data um, is, is another important step. Great. And I don't, we may or may not have time to get to the question was related to sort of indigenous communities, but and there's obviously geopolitical um, barriers to data sharing to nation states and so forth. But we'll see if we get back to that question. Back to that. <laughs> question from the audience. Carlos Salinas with Healing Bridges. Um, have there been, have you all considered doing a benefit cost analysis on AI? Um, the gentleman mentioned uh, the fossil fuel impact. Uh, the uh, National Rural Electric Cooperative Association recently cited uh, prediction of uh, increase uh, in, el in electric demand, 65% of it, which would be driven by AI and crypto and data centers. And then you compound that with autonomous warfare, you compound that with the applications you all have mentioned, you compound that with human greed, and then you reference uh, recent announcements by both Microsoft and Google that their voluntary net zero targets were going fast out of reach because of AI. Would you consider that maybe, given the urgency of the climate emergency, given the fact that we're locking in with each increasing emission, a much more dire future that's even harder to adapt to, harder to mitigate against, that maybe AI is something that we actually need to put a major pause until we can get our other stuff um, 
in order, including the ability of the political class to address adequately the climate emergency. Great. Um, that's a really interesting <laughs> overarching question. So sort of is AI itself inevitable? Um, uh, Priya, do you want to start with that? Sure. Um, so I guess I'd say AI is an accelerator of the systems in which it's employed. And so you can come to your, I think, own conclusions, but I think as strongly implied by the question about societally are our systems and the, the things that we're enabling as a society overall good or bad. Um, so I think the, the answer to the cost benefit analysis, even without very specific and quantified numbers is, is honestly clear, right? But I think the question is, would such a cost benefit analysis be actionable? The action, but if, if sort of you have a cost benefit analysis of the use of AI across the entirety of society and it comes out negative, are we actually going to be able to stop AI? That's no, right? And so I think what I would instead suggest is that we, we really, again, go dive into these efforts around um, transparency, about steering the ways that AI is used in by of um, kind of addressing societal incentives as a whole using kind of these cross-disciplinary perspectives and um, kind of understanding where AI fits in that. For particular applications, doing cross-benefit analyses, I think, is very actionable because then I think it um, enables us to figure out kind of whether we should do those applications or, or how we actually take that forward. But is a sort of a, a society-wide stop to AI, I think actually like a feasible solution? Unfortunately, no, but I think there is a lot of feasibility in steering what we do with AI um, and also for specific applications, deciding not maybe to do those specific applications. Yeah, so as I turn to the others, I mean, there have been proposals for other reasons to try to have pauses in AI that have gone nowhere, but as opposed to sort of a general pause, the notion of if you had laws, regulations said at, you can, uh, implement AI if you've met these energy or other um, criterion, that, that might have some of that effect, maybe equally undoable, but um, interesting to think about that. Uh, Uwe and then Topaz. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's um, an existential question that we are all facing. And uh, even within my organization, we've asked ourselves this. Um, I think there are three pathways. So, and that's how I'm going to answer the question based on our own internal dialogue. One is, yes, we need the cost benefit analysis just to understand, uh, is this really good? And should we stop it? We need that. But there is another dimension, which is that it's actually doing good um, in large portions of not just here in America, but around the world, that if we stop it, that you know, we are really, it's doomsday for those people. And then there is a middle ground, which is basically that it's, it's somewhere in between. And this is where issues of, if you look at it from a climate perspective, issues of climate justice comes in. And, and so I want to go back to the previous question and that I, I think we start with prayer uh, around indigenous communities, right? One of the things that we need to do is in terms of climate justice is to reimagine how we collect data. So Paz has talked about building trust. Well, there are two dimensions to this, right? One dimension is that we need to really uh, begin to invest in building capacity in these communities. Because if we involve them in the data collection and they are trained in its interpretation, those communities will trust the output of, from the data itself. That's one important dimension. The second, from a climate justice perspective, really is that a lot of the way we collect data right now is form-based. So it's basically looking at languages that are digitized because you know uh, there's a data collector either using a mobile phone or going from home to home and collecting data. Well, these communities, a lot of them are oral-based. And they have knowledge about the ecosystem. They have knowledge about biodiversity that is being left out. So, so those are two things I like to bring into the equation. It's in the middle there in terms of what we need to do. So it's not the polarity, end of the world, or it's extremely good, but it's to find this middle and find that hybrid approach. Thanks. Back to the sort of opening about, is it just one or the other? Um, Topaz. Yeah, I'll just say that, you know, because of where the conversation has been over the past few years, when we talk about AI, people tend to think about generative AI. 
And a lot of the applications uh, in, in climate are pulling from traditional models, traditional ML um, models. And so it's, it's very easy to like uh, focus on a bit of the existential stuff, but I think it's also important to remember that a lot of the work has been ongoing for quite some time um, and it does involve AI. And I think because of just how much um, conversation there has been around generative AI, that tends to swing us um, to the other side. And so, yeah, just wanted to add that. Great, thank you. Thanks. Um, question from online? Of course, our next online attendee writes, the consequences of predictive error are far worse in the energy and transportation sectors compared to the e-commerce sector. What is the roadmap for AI to gain the trust of such risk adverse industries to address climate challenges? Okay, um, and I'll say we've got about 10 minutes left, so we'll start compressing our answers, but go ahead, Priya. Sure, so I think um, the there are some really uh, great efforts at the moment to um, kind of bring together researchers and AI with the power industry in order to source requirements and again, change the way in which we develop methods. I'll, I'll flag, for example, the global, global Power Systems Transformation Consortium and then the uh, Electric Power Research Institute had um, an initiative around this for several years. Um, and just sort of making sure that some of those guarantees and requirements around physical feasibility, around notions of robustness, around um, uncertainty quantification are just built into the methods themselves. It is, uh, I think, an important path forward. Yeah, very quickly, and it's a point I've made already that accuracy matters, but the problem is that we do not have hyper-local data, not just in the global south, but even here in the US. And one here's one very profound statement. We honestly do not know how hot the world is right now as a result of this, that we do not really collect the right kind of data. Great. Um, to the audience. Thank you very much for the discussion so far. Uh, I am David Kay. I am chair of the National Extension Climate Initiative at Corn and I'm at Cornell University. My question is, I wonder if you could, so one of the things that many of us work on and think about in climate change uh, is the time, is timing, timelines, and particularly about the pace and scale of change that is needed to address both the mitigation and adaptation aspects of what we're all dealing with. So I'm wondering if you could situate your discussion about AI more in the context of costs and benefits that we can look towards in the near term and longer term with AI, particularly given all the emphasis you put on sort of trust and so on and, and building trust in communities and things like that uh, uh, regarding new technology. Thank yeah. you. Great question on the sort of where things fit in on a, on a timeline. Um, we want to start that one. I think we will go through everybody. Yeah. So. Um, so I'll use the traditional, um, I'll use what private sector is doing right now because they're doing great work, but I'll categorize it into the, what is called the classical data value chain. Um, so you start out and say, what do I know right now? What is, you know, what is the state of the world right now? Diagnostics, right? That's phase one. And, and phase two is, given what I know about the state of the world right now, can I make predictions about tomorrow? Yeah, that's phase two. And phase three becomes even much more deterministic. It says, so it's not about probability, about what's going to happen tomorrow. I know for certain that given what I know about now and what is probable tomorrow, here is what is certainly going to happen the day after tomorrow. I'm going to use that framing basically to answer your question. So uh, where are we right now? Where is the state of the technology? I think it's pretty darn good, and give, except for all the issues we talked about data. It's pretty darn good about diagnosing what is happening right now. What is the state of play right now? And it's accurate for the most part. Where it struggles is that next to cater. What's going to happen tomorrow? And what's going to happen the day after tomorrow? For that, I'm not a betting man, and I know there's a lot of work that is being done 
And I think that's gonna take a decade for this technology in terms of accuracy in prediction, especially when it comes to climate, especially given the issues that we've talked about on lack of representativeness in the data set, for it to be really accurate at a global level. But for now, in terms of diagnostics and how am I doing, I think it's pretty down good. So we can basically take now uh, and then project out 10 years from now in terms of the next level of, of evolution. Yeah, and I think, you know, part of the question, and we was getting at this too, is right, sort of does AI outrun climate or vice versa in a way? And um, obviously it's speculation, and it would also depend on what we actually do to get back to the lack of inevitability point that people have made. But what's your thinking on how these timetables intersect, which maybe gets back to the theoretical halt question also? Sure. So, um... I'd say that um, I would maybe diverge a little bit from Ui in this sense. I think that I agree that the kind of um, monitoring and state of play applications are, are mature, but I think we are already seeing some predictive applications that are also mature. So, I mean, the, the power industry very widely uses AI at this point for supply and demand forecasting. Um, we are starting to see some, some kind of inroads where AI is really facilitating um, Subseasonal forecasts and climate downscaling at larger timescales, which are not fully mature yet, but I actually think maybe maybe we're actually less, much less than a decade away. I think from being good there, mod the data problem. Um, and there are also places where AI is already being used to actually optimize and control real world systems. So thinking about heating and cooling systems in buildings and in data centers in order to bring their energy usage down. Um, I think the places where we have longer timescales on some of these optimization and control tasks is where you do have some of these safety considerations as well as um, kind of um, le legacy or heavily regulated industries that already are having to contend with really changing how they do things like the power sector. So there I think it's not that AI is itself the timeline bottleneck, but rather that it, there's, it's sort of entwined in the broader timeline bottleneck around kind of changing the internals of the, in the industry and kind of co-designing AI within that. Um, and there are some places where I think AI can be an accelerator of timelines. I don't think we need AI for clean materials discovery or clean technology discovery from in, in a fundamental sense, but from a timeline perspective, I think we do. Um, so I, I think that there are a lot of ways in which um, AI, even today, can be an enabler of kind of shortening timescales and doing doing things on the on the ground. Um, and so, uh, yeah. So I'd say it, it, it is here and now, and there's there's um, yeah. I'll pass. Yeah, I mean, plus one to all of that. Um, I do think that we're there in terms of predictive capabilities. Um, the future and what that looks like, I think there's a lot of work to be done on standard setting. Um, and, you know, the frameworks that exist in the climate space, we look at folks that are trying to measure scope three emissions. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of frameworks and standards that are out there. And so figuring out ways that we can streamline all of those efforts um, so that there's one central point that we're all looking to when we're thinking about our own emissions. Uh, I think too, um, in terms of just, so I think yes, there's, there's a framework and, and there's standards, but I also think there's still so much work to be done on the equity side of things. And um, we are starting to see the effects of that um, in the climate space today. Um, and future predictions only show that widening if, if there's not enough uh, policy implemented to um, reverse some of those issues. And so, yeah, those are the two points. Thank you. Thanks. Maybe uh, our last question, we'll take one more from the, the audience. Go ahead. Okay. My name is Jerome Kojokwedu. I'm the investor of Nebraska Lincoln. So my question is on the climate justice part. <laughs> I like the fact that um, one of the speakers mentioned that uh, AI is already specific on uh, diagnostics, right? So I just want to know, um, the first one is a rhetorical question, fatalities and uh, costs, which is more important. The human lives are more important than whatever cost goes into this whole conversation. So the second question, which is the more burdened one is, we've talked a lot about energy transition and the movement from fossil fuel to renewables. Now, those of us in the global, from the global south, uh, looking at the costs to transition completely from fossil fuel, for my country, for instance, it's gonna cost us about $410 billion, all right? 
So where is the conversation on this, on the global space? And uh, where is AI when it comes to this map, when you talk about the global south? What are the specifics? And uh, what's government policy is going to be, right, uh, be like? And um, who's going to champion this conversation? Are we going to expect National Academy of Science and the rest of everybody here, you know, to put that in the front burner? So these are my concerns. I want to know what um, AI is saying about carbon capture, when it's going to be ready for countries that are not ready to transition at the same pace as the, as the rest of the world. What's AI saying about that? Thank you. Great, thanks. Topaz, do you want to start with that one? So some of the... Okay, sure. <laughs> there was a lot in there. Um, do we, do you want to... Yeah, I'll take a piece of it. Yeah, uh, because we've struggled with this as well. And I'll give my personal uh, response when we talked about this in my organization. Um, again, from the perspective of the Global South, and I share the same lived experience with you. Um, it's, uh, I, I answered based on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, and, 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 and project that into societies and how we respond to your question. And because of that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we're not all at the same point, right? And there are societies, you're absolutely right, where when you look at the cost, it's about survival. It's about here and now. And, and from that perspective, therefore, given all of the ills and everything that we've said, there are societies that are waiting for this technology uh, to actually help them. So in, in, in Africa, 60% uh, basically is basic, uh, uh, what's called small scale holder farmers. And they are looking for methods and, and uh, techniques and mechanisms to help them to optimize on their farming so that they can actually live. AI can help them. And just, just based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that that's where a majority of the folks are right now. And that would be how I answer your question. Are there ills and there are evils? There are. But if you look at where needs are across, across societies, then it's about how can you use AI to meet people where they are. It's just, I mean, AI itself obviously isn't in Maslow's hierarchy. It's how it affects each of those things, that's exactly which right. gets back to some of the earlier points. Um, Priya, and then we'll go to Topaz and we'll close sure. up. Maybe just super quickly, um, kind of building on points earlier about where government and philanthropy can fill gaps. There is a great deal of sort of private sector funding from kind of powerful industries funding AI and AI research. So for example, you do see kind of large scale agricultural funding within AI and robotics, but you don't see the interests of smallholder farmers, for example, represented within those particular funding streams. So this is where I think uh, governments and philanthropy can really look at whose, whose needs are not being kind of met and how can we kind of foster applications of AI for those particular communities and not for, right, among, with, from those particular communities, importantly. Yeah, and I'll just add that I think it's also important, regardless of where a specific country is in their, in their journey, it's really important that they're involved in the conversations that are happening at a global level. And that's just to ensure that there's no one left behind. So um, I think in speaking like the sub-Saharan African con uh, context, a lot of countries are now coming up with their AI policies and their AI strategies. Of course, there's still so many unknowns um, and there's certainly a huge role that the Global North does have to, to play in terms of investment and funding and support for some of these initiatives. Um, but it's really important that there's um, inclusion in, in those conversations and also that there's a lot of investment in education. So literacy, AI literacy, and also just training folks to be ready for whatever that AI future looks like um, across different geographies, regardless of socioeconomics. Socio so let me end with sort of one broad question that'll ask for a very quick answer though. So we've been talking, these issues are inherently societal, institutional, et cetera. Um, if there was sort of, you were giving advice, one thing that individuals in the audience, both here and beyond, could be doing or thinking about regarding AI and climate? What would it be? So, Uy. I start, it's very simple. AI is not a magic bullet. Each of us have a, a role to play. Turn off the lights when you leave your home. <laughs> I mean, don't, and someday AI will do that for you, but whether that'll be a net benefit <laughs> or not, we'll see. Um, Ria. Um, put pressure 
on entities to kind of ensure that what they're doing is climate aligned. I think all of this sort of, we're talking about AI, right? We're talking about what companies can do. AI is one aspect of, they're going to use AI to do whatever is aligned with their profit motives, whatever is aligned with their business incentives, and government and regulation moves at a particular pace. So as individuals, I think we can put a lot of pressure on uh, private actors and society um, in, in, as one mechanism to align incentives. Yeah, and to the point of it's it's not a magic bullet, I think we also have to just remember that AI is a tool and it requires a lot of human input. And so just not being afraid to ask questions and to really interrogate what it is that um, a specific innovation or model is, is talking about. Um, I think the explainability point is really, really key here. Um, the worst thing that we can do is sort of look at this whole concept, oh, it's AI, I don't really understand it, and, and turn away. And so really just leaning in and um, trying to get that fundamental education and understanding of, of what AI actually is and what these different tools can do and what role that you might have to play, whether it's in climate or in health or whatever sector um, you're involved in. Great, thanks. So if people want more information on this, people should sign up for the, you can sign up for the uh, Academy newsletter on climate, which will have more on this. And also there's a breakout session, uh, I think in session four this afternoon uh, related to AI and climate. Um, with that, we, um, we did hit some of the points that are important in an Academy panel. People talked about the need for more research, so that was good. Um, and we also allowed us how maybe the whole technology should stop, so we covered the gamut. Um, and uh, with that, please uh, join me in thanking our panel.